what he is, praise God, and so therefore his spirit was separated from God. Why did he need to be begotten or born? Because he became like we were, separated from God. Because he tasted spiritual death for every man, and his spirit and inner man went to hell in my place. Can't you see that? Physical death wouldn't remove your sins. He tasted death for every man. He's talking about tasting spiritual death. Jesus is the first person that was ever born again. Why did his spirit need to be born again? Because it was estranged from God. He has Jesus in a prolonged condition of ceasing to be God and being man alienated from God in hell, trying to get his act together in order that he can be reborn. The Word Faith Movement has concocted this strange theology that makes sinners gods and makes the sinless Son of God into a sinner. Such teaching is utterly unbiblical. It demeans our Lord, it demeans His work as it is obvious to anyone. Furthermore, the atonement did not take place in hell. It was completed on the cross when Jesus said, It is finished, recorded in John 19.30. First Peter 2.24 says that Christ bore our sins in His body on the cross, not in hell. Colossians 2.13.14 says He canceled the debt of our sin and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Ephesians 1, seven says we have redemption through His blood. Blood here refers to His physical death, the actual shedding of His blood on the cross, and there is our forgiveness. Jesus promised the repentant thief, today you'll be with me. Where? Paradise. He wasn't in hell for three days. He served notice to hell that the powers of evil were defeated. The Bible knows nothing of the kind of atonement that exists in this word faith teaching. The Bible knows nothing about the kind of Jesus they're talking about either. They have the wrong God and the wrong Jesus. Thirdly, they have the wrong faith. They have the wrong faith. This is a fascinating and very uh, central part of their system. Let me help you to understand this. They teach that faith is some kind of, some kind of law, some kind of inviolable, immutable, unchanging, impersonal law, that it's like gravity, that anybody, anybody who gets involved with it gets the same results. I mean, you could take ten people up to the top of a building, and you could have three of them that understood the law of gravity, three of them that knew nothing of the law of gravity, and three of them that didn't believe the law of gravity exists, and one person who was deaf, dumb, and blind and didn't know anything. And if they all jumped, they'd all go down. Why? Because the law of gravity works no matter what you believe. The law of gravity is fixed. It's not a question of faith. It's not a question of anything. You jump, it, you go down. And they take that same concept, like the law of gravity, and move it into the spiritual dimension and say faith is like that. Doesn't matter who you are, if you just enact the law of faith, it'll work. Pat Robertson, for example, was asked if the laws of the kingdom work even for non-Christians. This is what he wrote in his book called Answers to 200 of Life's Most Probing Questions. He wrote, yes, these are not just Christian and Jewish principles any more than the law of gravity is Christian and Jewish. The laws of God work for anybody who will follow them. The principles of the kingdom apply to all of creation. And what the law of faith is all about is if you believe you can have something, you'll get it. If you believe you're going to get well, you get well. If you believe you're going to get money, you'll get money. If you believe you're going to get married, you'll get married. Because you're, you're enacting a law and it's an immutable, inviolable law that works for anybody, anytime. It's impersonal. It's fixed. And what the error of this is, simply stated, is that this puts confidence in the nature of faith rather than in the object of faith. It assumes that there's something inherent in believing that enacts something when it isn't true at all. It is not the nature of faith that is effective, it is the object of faith. It is my faith in God 
that gets results, not my faith in faith. There used to be a song when I was a kid, and it was a pretty popular one, I Believe. You remember that song? I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. And it went on, I believe, I believe. And that was the whole sentence, I believe. And you kept wanting to say, you believe what? You believe whom? You believe how? No, I believe. And sometimes you'll hear people, secular people interviewed, and they say, well, I'm a, I'm a person with, with real faith. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a really a believing person. Oh, good. Well, what do you believe? Oh, I, I just believe in believing. Good. You see, this is the same kind of secular concept taken over into this movement that says, if you apply the law of faith, if you just sort of screw up your faith and say, I believe, you'll make it materialize. If you can just eliminate doubt and eliminate all negative thought and just think super positive and really believe hard, I don't know how hard you have to believe, but harder than most people are able to believe, obviously. There are some people who get rich in this movement, and you know who they are. <laughs> most of the people stay right where they are, just as poor and unhealthy as they were before they learned this stuff. Faith, according to word faith doctrine, is not submissive trust in God. It is not belief in revealed revelation in the Scripture. Faith is a formula by which you manipulate the universe, by which you manipulate things. Caps, Charles Caps says, words governed by spiritual law become spiritual forces working for you. Idle words work against you. The spirit world is controlled by the Word of God. The natural world is to be controlled by man speaking God's words. So if you just believe and say it with your mouth, you'll make it happen. That's your creative power again. As the name word faith implies, this movement teaches that faith is a matter of what we say more than in whom we trust or what truths we embrace and affirm in our hearts. A favorite uh, expression in the Word Faith movement is positive confession. Have you heard that? Positive confession. It refers to the Word Faith teaching that your words will create. They have creative power. They say, what you say, you create. So if you believe it strongly enough to speak it, you'll create it. You'll create your riches, you'll create your health, you'll get out of your wheelchair. It determines everything that happens to you, they say. Your confessions, based upon your faith in faith, will bring things to pass. And God has to act because it's a law. Whether you're Christian, Jewish, or non-Christian, it's going to work. Kenneth Hagin writes, quote, You can have what you say. You can write your own ticket with God. And the first step in writing your own ticket with God is say it. Say it. And what they're trying to do is, is get you to say it and say it and say it and say it until you finally convince yourself you believe it. And then supposedly, once you're saying it becomes believing it, you will create it. He later says, does Kenneth Hagin, if you talk about your trials, your difficulties, your lack of faith, your lack of money, your faith will shrivel and dry up. But bless God, if you talk about the Word of God, your lovely Heavenly Father, and what He can do, your faith will grow by leaps and bounds. So you just have to talk about it, talk about it. In his uh, little booklet called How to Write Your Own Ticket with God, Hagen's supposedly inspired four-point sermon is, say it, do it, receive it, and tell it. Hagen claims Jesus told him, if anybody anywhere will take these four steps or put these four principles into operation, he will always have whatever he wants from me or God the Father. Psst, write your own ticket. The idea, of course, has bred superstition, terrible disappointment, tragic things. Magical incantations is all they are. It's a form of voodoo. It has no value beyond that. Charles Capps warns against the dangers of speaking negative confession. He says, we've programmed our vocabulary with the devil's language. We've brought sickness and disease into our vocabulary and even death. The main word so many people use to express themselves is death. The word death, I'm just dying to do that. They'll say, I'm going to die if I don't. That just tickled me to death. Now that, my friend, is perverse speech. 
That's contrary to God's Word. Death is of the devil. We need not buddy up with death. All men are going to die soon enough, but so don't start buddying up to it now. In other words, you don't want to say those words because it might happen. That's how powerful you are. You can kill yourself. <laughs> Positive confession, listen, would rule out the confession of sin, wouldn't it? Word faith books on prayer, word faith books on spiritual growth are utterly lacking in any teaching about confessing sin. Of course, they undermine the crucial teaching of 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In fact, positive confession encourages people to absolutely ignore their sins and deny their reality, doesn't it? You don't want to mention anything negative. It has produced multitudes of people who perpetually wear these emotionless smiles out of fear. Fear that a negative confession might bring them bad fortune, and so they may be piling up sin which is never, ever dealt with. This is like the Hindu view of karma or some pagan concept of bad luck. I don't want to say that because it might bring me bad luck. Hagen admits he feels that way himself. I'm quoting him. I wouldn't tell anybody if I had a doubt thought or a fear thought. He won't say a sin thought or a sin. But he says, I wouldn't accept it. I wouldn't tell somebody if the thought came to me, and you know the devil can put all kinds of thoughts in your mind. We're a product of words. Did you ever stop to think the Bible teaches that there's a health and healing in your tongue? So he says, you, you, you must never say things that are negative. I never talk of sickness. I don't believe in sickness. I talk health. I believe in healing. I believe in health. I never talk sickness. I never talk disease. He's just talking sickness and talking disease. I talk healing. I never talk failure. I don't believe in failure. I believe in success. I never talk defeat. I don't believe in defeat. I believe in winning. Hallelujah to Jesus. Now they won't say the word sin. They won't say we never talk sin, but they never talk sin. That perspective is rife with obvious problems. Bruce Barron tells of one Word Faith Church where the pastor rose sheepishly to instruct his congregation on a ticklish concern. Some of the church members he had heard were spreading contagious diseases among the church's little ones by bringing their sick babies to the nursery. Against the nursery's volunteers' protests, these parents were positively confessing that their children were well. <laughs> this is true. Since the parents had claimed their healing, there was nothing to worry about. They may have been dismissing those persistent whines and coughs as lying symptoms, but those lying symptoms proved to be contagious, and only an announcement from the pulpit could succeed in putting an end to the problem. It's foolish. Word faith, denial of diseases and problems as lying symptoms robs believers of an opportunity to minister with compassion and understanding to suffering people. Uh, would you like to be in a word faith church and have the gift of showing mercy and try to find somebody who would admit they needed it? You might look a long time because everybody would be running around saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm well, I'm whole, I'm healed, I'm rich. How are you going to help somebody when nobody's allowed to talk about anything? How can you help someone whose symptoms you believe are lies from Satan, or worse, the result of sinful unbelief, that any time somebody's sick, it's because they're a sinful unbeliever? Consequently, many word faith devotees tend to be unfeeling, callous, indifferent, even to the point of being coarse and abrasive toward people they assume don't have enough faith to claim a healing. Bruce Barron tells of a pastor and his wife unable to bear children who were told by a member of their church that they needed to confess a pregnancy and display their faith by purchasing a baby stroller and walking down the street with it. <laughs> now that is pretty callous, don't you think? A few years ago I received a heart-rending letter from a dear woman who was deceived by positive confession theology, believed God wanted her to write everyone she knew with a baby announcement for the child she was hoping to conceive. She was incapable of having children, but she sent out all these baby announcements. Months later, she had to write to everyone again to explain the expected faith baby didn't come. 
She was quick to add, however, that she was still claiming.